Some are always looking for more sports content, and among the glut of sports media, some are looking for sports content that dives a bit deeper and doesn't just stick to sports. So check out Backpack Broadcasting's original long-form sports journalism series, Sideline Stories. The award-winning original series takes viewers directly into underrepresented communities within the world of sports. It's a series that goes beyond traditional sports reporting, like box scores and statistics, presenting exclusive stories that you won't find anywhere else. With a diverse group of correspondents, the series provides interviews and interesting stories around the world of sports, because there is so much beyond the game, and so much that occurs off the field or court that impacts each of us and the world we live in. Giving a voice to athletes, coaches, fans, and everyone involved in athletics, Sideline Stories looks to push sports storytelling further than ever before. It's a winner of the 2020 Independent Shorts Awards, and all episodes of Sideline Stories are available for viewing today on Backpack Broadcasting's YouTube channel and Facebook page. Hard to Tell Podcast, episode 173, Dexter Henry, Brian Fonseca here. Sure. Still doing what we got to do, still keeping it safe, still keeping it socially distanced. Hopefully y'all are out there getting ready to get vaccinated. I am proud to announce, excited to announce, I'm going to get my first vaccine shot uh, probably the day after you hear this episode. Uh, oh, that announcement. Okay. That announcement, yes. <laughs> uh, there's another announcement. We'll talk about that later in the month. Can't wait for that. I can't wait for that. But right. let's, just, let's just say, uh, like the movie Amistad, I got me my free. More on that later. But uh, I will get a... I will, I don't, you probably don't even know that movie. That probably went over your head. Anyway, give us us free. Movie, famous, yeah. line, famous line from the movie. Anyway. Um, vaccination, important. Uh, you know, hopefully a lot of people get it. I've had friends... We've got it already. A bunch of family who's got it already. Um, please, folks, try to, you know, we talked about this on this podcast. We talked about being safe. Brian and I have talked about COVID. I had to battle it in January. Thankfully, I've been fine. But it's also important now with the vaccine around to get vaccinated if you can. Uh, you know, definitely want to stay healthy. Like I said, I'm, I'm excited to do it. So opening up to Places like New York, it just opened up the previous week to 30 and over. By the time you hit this podcast, folks in NYC 16 and over can get it. So now Brian uh, will be eligible to go get it. So <laughs> that's a good thing, man. Um, I'm excited to see that. I'm concerned that some people are going to wild out this summer. But, you know, at the same time, um, we seem to be trending to a healthier society in terms of the pandemic as we try to move towards herd immunity. What's the first reckless place you're going to go once you have the vaccine? Because everybody has a place. Like, what's the place you're going to go to? Ooh, like, that's like good. You're, you're probably full on, probably shouldn't go. Because I'm already, like, I haven't obviously gotten it yet. I'm um, going to start trying to make the appointment now that I'm eligible. But I don't, it's crazy, man. I'm looking at that mess schedule. I'm like, hmm. That might be it. I mean, <laughs> I, I think if I'm vaccinated and people are still spaced out at a game, I would go to a Mets game. Yeah, um, I don't want to sit nobody yet. Yeah, or I don't want to sit next to nobody that's not vaccinated. <laughs> like that, yeah, like, yeah, like right. if you got the vaccine and you was like, "Yo, let's go to a game." Oh, I'm good. I know you've been living right. That's another thing too. Yeah, yeah. I know yeah, you've yeah. been. I, <laughs> I know you've been living right. So you know, if Brian was like, "Yo, let's I can't go to take these chances." You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. my, my, I got people that I live with that work in healthcare Facts. and they're just older. You know what I mean? So I gotta, I gotta be extra careful. Facts. You know? I mean, so. but that—that's you thinking about other people. People should think yeah. about, you know, you thinking about those people and then the beyond. So for me, I think whatever I will be doing will be with people who are vaccinated. Now I've hung out with friends. I've socially distant hung out with friends uh, throughout the pandemic. Uh, even a couple of weeks ago, I was hanging out with some friends. But it, you know, he said risky. Well, I'd go to a Met game. I guess you'd call that risky. You know, Mets Mets are getting about 10,000 people in the ballpark. The Mets and Yankees here in New York. Uh, I was in D.C. last week for the home opener that got canceled with the Mets. And they were only going to have 5,000. And then you got the Texas Rangers who were out here <laughs> out here not giving a fuck. Uh, and they yeah. got 47,000 people full capacity. In Houston, they have half capacity. Those are the only two teams at 50% or more. It's It's crazy, bro. Like, that stuff is... What what are we doing? It's just it's didn't just Greg thing. Abbott didn't Greg Abbott wasn't he going to throw out the first pitch and he said no or something like that? I didn't. I, nah, I didn't even see that. 
So somebody was like, no, because the building was just too crazy. It was too packed. It was, no, 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 no. You know who Greg Abbott is? Is no. it? Hold on. All right. You you talk while I find, while I go find us. Right. So, because I need I need to verify this. Okay. I, I mean, wherever he was and he didn't feel comfortable to do it, I probably don't blame him on not wanting to do no, that. He, no, that's no, fine. no, 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 no. He ain't, he ain't, he's not on the right side of history. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, he, he, <laughs> I, I don't I, – I think I have that wrong. But there was something that he tweeted out. He's been tweeting out a lot of bullshit. Is he the governor of Texas? He's something of Texas. I don't know what he is. But uh, I'm looking for it right now on Twitter. Here we go. I was looking forward. This is a tweet from Greg Abbott. Greg Abbott, uh, at Greg Abbott underscore TX on Twitter. He is the Texas governor. Oh, so he's Texas governor. Oh, well, he said dumb shit in the past. Yeah. I was looking forward to throwing out the first pitch at the Texas Rangers home opening game until at MLB adopted what has turned out to be a false narrative about Uh, Georgia election uh, law. It is shameful. This walks us right into something that we were going to talk about today. It is shameful that America's pastime is being influenced by partisan politics. Well, that's that's the narrative for that. That's those side of folks that want to continuously say that. We're going to get into more of that later. However, that governor... Why did the Texas Rangers invite him to throw out the first pitch? Like, get out of here, yo. What are you doing? Because it's Texas. Uh, yeah. That's right. right. Look... <laughs> A lot of people moving to Austin too. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's that's one small part that's very progressive. I'm not saying that all of Texas is like this, but most of Texas, yeah, oh. they rock with the governor on that. Before we get into Georgia, because I've had more of these conversations with people as I've gotten older. Before we get into Georgia, uh, would you ever? Because my my answer to the following question is absolutely not. I don't think I could be able to tolerate it. Would you ever live in a swing state? Yo, that's a real <laughs> yo. Here's why that's a really good question, because I also have recently had this conversation with a lot of people, and red states out of the question for me. Can't do it. Well, okay, but then would you go live in Georgia where it's recently turned blue? No, because it's a swing state. Swing states make me nervous. Because because here's the thing: we're we're spoiled as New Yorkers, where we don't really have to worry about that. You know what I mean? For the foreseeable future. We don't really have to worry about that. And, and you know, it's it's likely going to stay. It's one of the few places that yeah. you know it's going to stay. And cities generally are blue, like across the country, if you look. Cities usually are. But, you know, the city is not the entire state. If you go through New York, the city is mostly blue, but upstate and Long Island, eh, there's some part, There's some parts that are red. It's just not enough for those people. Not to say that it don't matter, but it's not enough to turn in. Yeah, a lot uh, of uh, uh, when I live in a swing state, I feel like none of the swing states have anything really attractive for me to do that. Possibly, possibly other than Georgia, because there's Atlanta and there's people and there's people in that metro area and surrounding suburbs that look like me and is growing even more rapidly. There's a lot of transparent New Yorkers and other stuff where it would be fine. However, it comes with a caveat. With the stuff you see going on in Georgia and how hard they are going to try to stop black folks and people of color from voting, makes you want to be like, yo, do I even want to deal with this at all? Probably not. Um, and, and you're right, Brian, you make this great point, right? Like, we are spoiled and we don't have to think about this stuff and we don't really have to be like, oh man, like, I worry about this or, or no, like, little things, right? Like, you know what? When we try to reopen stuff, we try to get the vaccine, or, or we're just going to have people, our governor is going to tell say that people should wear masks. We're going to have a mask mandate. We're not going to lift it early. When we do open stuff up and we have people in the Mets game, just for example, like you mentioned, we, we can trust that, hey, they're not going to go to full capacity on the first day like some idiot-ass governors do in that state of Texas. Like, you, you know, okay. it's, you have faith that, like, people are going to do right by the people and not for their own self-interest to some degree, which is what you don't see on the other side. And that's the problem I have. They clearly don't care about the people. That's that's the problem. Like, do you want to live in a place where they don't care about the people? Like, yo, that that's the thing. Yeah, I was just talking with my boy in Arizona, right? And he went out the other day. It's like hot, so they're trying to go out early, take the dog to the dog park, and they go there. And he told me that he's like, yo, son, nobody in there is wearing any mask, and he he's got one on. But they're looking at him like people looking at him like he's crazy. Like this is Arizona, Arizona, Phoenix, See, Phoenix a area. See, that's a, that's a state that I kind of like. That's a state that's generally red most right. of the time. I, but I see the potential of it turning blue because, one, we almost saw it, and, two, there are more Mexicans uh, moving to 
parts of Arizona. However, I, it's not really enough. I still think <laughs> I, still, I still think they're a, a ways away. And there's and you know the governor lifted the mask mandate there, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff. So it it, it it's I'm sorry, like I don't necessarily want to live where people clearly don't care about people who look like me or Brian. And the people in leadership don't right. care about people who look like me or Brian. So I guess, you know, the more I think about it, no. <laughs> the answer is no. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> it, it's, it's like, too, it's another variable to worry about. Like in New York City, the things we have to worry about is like, you know, space, rent, uh, just being able to afford, you know, living here because cost of living is so high. Even though, you know, there's an upside to that. Like you're sort of paying for convenience and things of that nature. And it's like you could see where the benefits could outweigh other things. Like if I had it my way and I'm able to make an adequate amount of money and so save an adequate amount of money and continue to move up in my life, I would just dug it out in New York for the rest of my life. Yeah, see, you know? see, and that goes to show the privilege that like like we as people of color have to think about, yo, can we live there? Is it actually good for us? Is it good for our health? Is it good for our stress? Also, white folks can be like, oh, I want to move here. I want to, and they don't have to ever think about that. And that's a privilege. They're, they're going to Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. They're going to Puerto Rico to further con colonize. 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 <laughs> colonize. colonize. That sounds like they're, a bad uh, medical and, procedure. We just had Julio Ricardo Valera up here, Varela up here. And we in I was listening to I think it was the last episode of the La, La Brega podcast series at Futuro Media. And they had interviewed uh, this white woman who, like, just sort of packed up and moved to Puerto Rico or whatever, mm. who is not Puerto Rican at all. And, you know, they would talk about, like, you know, just why she moved out there. And, you know, do you recognize that you're giving up voting rights? And, you know, do you care? And she's like, you know, it's kind of like she described it as, like, you're getting the benefits of living in America without really living in America outside of like the whole voting thing, because like the taxes are, you know, much easier to navigate through and, you know, this, this and that. But it's like people with privilege could just pick up and kind of do that. You know what I mean? Like when you watch certain shows on HGTV, you see these white couples and they're able to move to somewhere in Greece because they don't got really shit to worry about over here. Well, there's also there's also like a whole history of generational wealth, right? Like to be able to do that. That's like right. what's yeah. what sucks is like and to the your point that you make, if you tomorrow wanted to pick up and go home to Puerto Rico, you might not necessarily be able to do that. But these folks and I'm, people should be able to go wherever they want, can come in and occupy other cultural spaces. It doesn't really bother me that they go there. I think what bothers me is the things that happen after they go there and they think that, yeah. and that, you know, they act like this happens even in places like here in Brooklyn. They act like they own the, the culture or the street or what's going on and want to tell the Puerto Ricans how to live in their own land. Like, yo, calm that, calm, calm that stuff down, uh, Betty. Calm that down. You ain't got to do all that. <laughs> To that woman's credit, she seemed like she was actually like, you know, because she talked about, because they asked her that she, she talked about like, you know, potentially investing in the neighborhood and, you know, mm -hmm. not just being somebody who's going to freeload here, but actually like, you know, do things that matter in the community and things like that. It's a good episode. Uh, Y'all should listen to it. But there are a lot of people to that point. Like, uh, I don't know if it was Logan Paul, Jake Paul, doesn't matter. Like one of them moved over there and then it was actually Julio who tweeted at Jake Paul or Logan Paul, like, all right, what are you actually going to do for the people of Puerto Rico as opposed to just like getting up and moving over there. Right. And there are a lot of, there are people moving down there because it's the same thing. Like you could evade, uh, a substantial amount of taxes, especially if you're coming from a place like New York, <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Where, there's a huge cut of your salary coming out and things of that nature. Um, and, you know, a lot, a lot of people could afford to could literally afford to do that because the type of jobs, it's like, you know, if you're a working class citizen, it's very difficult for you to just pick up and go somewhere, especially if it's out of the state. And like I said, what's more bothersome is people who are of the culture who might want to invest in land or, you know, I don't know if your family has land in Puerto Rico or want to go back home or eventually I've, 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 settle I've there. that we do. So I've settle their roots. So. I think about that stuff all the time. Like some of the prime real estate in Grenada, when you go back, is not owned by people who are Grenadian. <laughs> it's good. like there are people yep. who they're, they're white folks owning these homes and this land that, and that has a lot to do with colonialism. So there's a long thing behind that, but it's very frustrating. And you know, sadly, even for us who are immigrants or first generation immigrants, we don't have the freedoms to just be like, yeah, we want to go back home and go there. And then there's people living in this country who have more freedoms because they've had, because of 
colonialism and slavery and exploitation and all this other stuff that have the freedoms to be like, oh, we come into your land and just buy this place here. And yeah, man, that's not cool. And then, well, meanwhile, yeah. to bring it back to your point, we have to think about in this country, like, sh- shit, is it safe for me to live in this state? Because I don't want to necessarily do that. We already know how we feel about Florida. No, thanks. Not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> We're not, not doing See, that. That's, and, uh, and that's important to point out because a lot of people from New York in particular, uh, Latinos even, especially, like, will go to Orlando. You know what I mean? Or we'll go to Miami. We'll go to Tampa. That's your, de- like that's, that. that's, your, that's, your, that's your destiny. It's in your destiny to retire there, Brian. Yeah. Like, I've heard family members talk about this. I have family members who've done it. And for me, it's like, I just I have no interest in doing that because I'm so concerned about things politically, especially under, I mean, in the foreseeable future, like I said, if I could afford to just be in New York, I will stay in New York. Like, my options in terms of, like, like... Arizona's interesting, but they need to do some things. They need to get their shit together. Colorado's interesting, but I'm not sure because they have mass shooting issues. You know what I'm saying? Like Denver no, is a I'm, nice I'm not, place. I'm, I'm laughing because sadly this country hasn't done anything about it, which is whew, so that's just a whole right. Thing, so. Well, it, and, and the South in general is like kind of iffy. So I'm kind of like looking at New York or California, right? Like that's just kind of what it comes down to. And the difference between New York and California that I always compare, the biggest thing is like in New York, you at least have a functional uh, mass transit system by comparison to California. We don't think it's that functional, but at least we have it. California, you got to drive everywhere, which is another pain. In the yeah, ass. everything is spread out from even like the city of L.A. And I like L.A. And I mean, I mean, San Francisco, which you haven't been to. San Francisco, very functional. So I, so, so I want to go to San Diego. Also. Yeah, San Francisco's got a great uh, mass transportation system. They're They're fine. Like I... Okay, I, I actually, I but actually the, look at how look how costly it is. The area, just as just they're more, on the it's coast, more expensive more than, New than New York. I love San Francisco. If there was a place I probably had the second place I'd want to move in this country, it probably would be there. I love San Francisco a ton. I really like it. Uh, yeah, we get to a whole place. Look, I like LA is cool. Um, I like San Francisco been, more. Yeah. I have not been to San Diego, uh, and the other places I would like to check out on the Pacific Northwest is Seattle and Portland. I feel, like, range too much. I feel like Portland, I don't know about that for me particularly, but, you know, a friend of the, friend of the show, uh, Tom Lorenzo, he used to be out there for some time. He told me he's really nice. So I got to get out there some time and see that. But I'll tell you where I would go. You know where I would definitely love to live? It's not in this country. Toronto. I love Toronto. Yo, I'll yeah, go there yeah, in a heartbeat. Okay. So, so okay, we talked about places that we want to go to uh, once we're all shot up and everything. And for me, I have been planning in my head this Canada oh yeah, that's right. For a minute, yeah. Montreal, Toronto. I've been wanting to do it, so that's kind of like the, that's kind of like hmm, you know, my test drive because I'm gonna be out. I want to be out there for a while, at least three days each city, uh, and then see what happens. And I actually know a couple people out there so that I could try to link up with, but I, that and but that's probably more of a 2022 thing at this point. We'll I, see. I have a. Uh, I want to go because I've never been to Canada. Before. Yeah, I should probably be doing uh, a small like family trip down to Ocean City, Maryland at some point later in the summer. Uh, but wait, I'm waiting for things to open up a little bit more. Grenada probably will be 2022 and some other some other island destinations I like to do. So we'll probably push that off. But uh, I, do, I sure know where I don't want to live in this country. I tell you that. I definitely know the places I don't want to live. And I'm not even stereotyping because I've been to some of these places to know enough that I don't want to live there. This isn't me stereotyping or going off of uh generalizations i've been to some places in the south that i like and i could see myself there like charlotte is cool uh that i don't mind i mean i love the dmv i was just in dc recently i love the whole dmv area it's nice so i'm yeah. fine i'm fine with that um yeah and i mean i have friends in the dmv just hanging out with the homie christina Correga last week at her new place shout out to her and um mm-hmm. yeah but like you know like i said charlotte's nice. i've been to charleston in south carolina that's a very nice city uh, which shows a little bit more diversity, but the city is nice. Um, Savannah, Georgia, I also went to. That's a cool city. That's a little slower. Wish that also had a little. It's kind of more like Charleston. Um, I have a friend who works down there now too. But look, I know where I don't want to go. And like Texas, it's funny because Texas. You know where I like in Texas. I've been, I've been to a couple places in Texas. I like Austin. I've been to Austin. Very heard, nice, progressive. Good, yeah. Love it. I've been there. I, granted, I was there for South by Southwest. And that was a great time, but which I encourage everybody to go when that opens back up. That will be a place to go. Maybe not right, maybe a couple of years that when we're into this, 
But that'll that be, be a, that might be a plan, actually. People are gonna flock to stuff like that. That was great. And I also really like Houston. And I have a bunch of friends down there. Houston just gets so humid in the summer, but I Her. do I do like Houston and Houston's a really nice city. Um and yeah. there's and there's a good amount of black and Latino folks there. So take it for take That's it for what it's worth. I'm with, I'm with, I- and I'm with you on the DMV because I like that area a lot. I like cities. You know what I mean? I don't want to live in the middle of nowhere. Boston. Or at least... Boston. Yo, know, Boston was nice. It was just... It's Boston. You know? Like... <laughs> <laughs> Boston was nice. Providence, Providence seems low-key and cool. It just seems kind of boring. I'm not a person That's that a needs, little too needs slow a ton for of me. Music. Yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah, it's, I don't, I'm not a person that needs like a ton of excitement, but I like speed. Like, I remember I met a photographer, uh, who's doing quite well now. Um, it, he was a photographer, it was 2016, it was the first UFC event I covered. Uh, black dude, funny as hell, too. And he, um, was like from San Diego. It was his first time or one of his first times in New York or something like that. He's like, damn, son. Like this shit is so fast. I can't even like yeah. move around here. You like got- it's crazy. And it's cr- it's interesting hearing that. And I-, I was 22 at the time, but it's interesting hearing that from like an adult or whatever, because like we have perceptions about the West Coast and they have perceptions about the East Coast, not in a bad way or anything like that. But you just don't sort of realize like the speed of how things move here and how we're oh, so conditioned to it. It's different. And I think especially in New York, like I remember in college, this dude from Miami was up with us uh, at at the Big East tournament. I was walking down 34th Street and something. 30, I don't remember. 8th Avenue and like 35th or something like that. Away from the garden. And he said to me, yo, this is just too busy. How do y'all do this? Like, this is it. Like, it was just too much for him. Like, the busy. And I've had other people come to New York. It's like, I like New York. Come and visit. But it's too much. And I get it. If you come from someplace else. And it's hilarious because if you go someplace different. Like I remember, I remember going to college in Pittsburgh, and I remember the first time. Like I, th- this was funny. I'll never forget this. I remember it was my first week in school or something, and I had like these khaki pants, and I used to, you know, take my khakis to get go to the dry cleaner to get clean. The dry cleaner was like right around the corner from my dorm. I must have came in from class. I think I had a class that finished like four thirty. Ran into my dorm, grabbed the khakis. Threw it in the bag with some other clothes, went downstairs, hit the hit the uh hit the dry cleaners, thinking that I'm gonna be able to drop this off. Happened to be five o'clock. Five o'clock they were done. I'm like, what dry cleaners closes at five o'clock? And it's just like in certain cities, things close earlier, things move slower. I had to adjust to the fact that getting my hair cut. I remember one time I got up, I was like, oh, I'm gonna get my hair cut on a Sunday. Nah, that's not how it is in Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh, no barbershops are open on Sunday. And that That's was crazy. wild to me. Like in New York, people are like, yo, you're losing money. How are you not open on a Sunday? Yeah. <laughs> and, and there they're like, why are you not resting? We're watching the Steeler game. And so. It, uh, I, but you know what? I kind of I kind of see it. Like I yeah. would like that. I, I, to some degree. I, I like it. We kind of hustle too hard here. And then we have expectations about how stuff should go, go, go all the time. And it's kind of crazy. And that was just ingrained in me. Or I couldn't stand that people walk so slow to get to class. I'm like, yo, don't y'all got somewhere to go? And I remember my, my boys who were from Philly, uh, and they ended up being my roommates. They were like, damn, son, yo, you be walking fast. They didn't say son because they're from Philly. But they, they were like, damn, you be walking fast. And I'm like, yo, I was old. I'm always moving. Yo, New Yorkers are always moving. And it's hard because it's part of your energy. So when you go to places that are so much slower, like I don't feel it. If you go to Chicago, you'll be like, they move in a, a good way. Or even if you're in Toronto, you'll find or you're in San Francisco, you'll feel that energy and move. But like when you're in Southern California, LA, there's a different vibe that's just slower to it. It's not the same. It's just so different. Um, and I like it. The Bay Area is more laid back, but at least San Francisco still has that energy. And I just love that. Man, we went on a whole tangent about where we'd like to live. Now, if we get <laughs> Brian, if we can get Brian to move to Boston, that'll be great. Nah, nah. I'm cool. I mean, there, look, there are Latinos in Boston. Don't get it twisted. There are black folks in Boston, too, as we both know. Yeah. It's just <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's a little different than yeah. some other places. Well, well, when we had our man Julio on, I had to ask him how his experience was and how everything was with that because we know Boston has a reputation uh, in dealing with folks like us. And uh, it's not, not that great for everybody's experience up there, should we say. City, the city is blue, though, which is surprising. 
I guess, if you're from the outside of it. But no, you know. no, I, actually, you're not. You should be worried about the places around it. That that that's different. Yeah. Like, like I've talked to one one of my friends who he grew up in Cambridge, and uh, some of the politics of people out there is is, is different than uh. No. But it goes to the point earlier. Cities are usually blue. Yep. You know, cities are yep. the places you don't got to worry about. So for me, it's like when it comes down to where I'm where I'm going to live in the future. Like it's looking more and more like New York, Cali, or that's it. It you looks. Know what it, I mean? it looks. Like, it looks like for you, it's not a red state. That's for sure. No, I can't do it. I too much to worry about, especially now. Like this is not something I would have considered uh, five years ago, right? But you, this time, five years ago, you think about it. You think about this stuff as you get older. Backpack Broadcasting continues to bring you the best original sports content, but now you can get more of the content you love. For as little as $3 a month, you can get access to bonus content, including behind-the-scenes footage and interviews from the Sports Walk, Sideline Stories, or the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast. All this exclusive content comes via Patreon. There are tiered levels of patronage, and each Backpack Broadcasting patron receives exclusive perks. Your support helps Backpack Broadcasting create more of the original content that you love. Visit Backpack Broadcasting's Patreon page and become a patron today. Speaking of red states, Georgia. <laughs> we talked about Georgia. And obviously... Really a blue state at this point. Well, yes. <laughs> it turned to a blue state, but people are so mad that it turned to a blue state they decided, to, you know what, we got to get more racist. How can we get more racist? And for people who don't know, you know, look, we've had history in this country of voter suppression, excuse me, of not allowing black and brown folks to vote uh, in the ways pro- they should. And there was an election bill that was signed on Wednesday by Governor Kemp, Brian Kemp, uh, who is a Republican. Um, and this drew a lot of protest. Uh, it is a uh, overhaul of state elections that includes new restrictions on voting by mail and greater legislative control on how elections are run. Some of the things involved in this, Brian, is even as much as if you were online voting, someone could not bring you food or water. So if your mom was online voting in Georgia and she's waiting, you can't bring her food or water. Also, that needs to be understand understood here is that a lot of in a lot of low income and black and brown areas of Georgia, polling sites have been shut down. So now people have to go even further out. So in a lot of these lower income or black and brown communities, what do people generally have to do during the hours you can vote? Work, so they can't get it. So now the lines might be longer and they can't stand it. And they might need somebody to bring some of them some food or something. No, they don't want you to do that. So it's going to try to discourage people, particularly black and brown people, from being able to vote. Now, these folks are so mad, as I said at the top, because the state turned blue in the last election. And here's the thing. You knew this was going to happen. This is America. This is racist-ass America. They weren't going to stand by and say, we're going to let this stuff happen. We're going to let just let it blue. They've been cheating the game. They've been trying to screw over black and brown people from being able to vote. And they said, you know what? We're going to try to do it again. They have no shame. Governor Kemp signed this bill with five white men standing around him. It doesn't get any whiter and racist than that. That's not, it doesn't get any whiter or racist than that. And he's like, I'm okay with this. They don't even care about the optics. So people are upset. People have been protesting. This has been all over the news, uh, which is crazy. The state house in Georgia approved this 100 to 75. Um, and Kemp signed a bill less than two hours after it cleared. Blah, 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 blah. And this is just ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, President Biden has spoken about how this is and how this, you know, affects black and brown folks and ties into voter suppression and all that. So tons of people have spoken out about this. We, we, we know what this is. But how does this tie in with something we talk about, which is sports? This ties in because last week on Friday, MLB, Major League Baseball Commissioner Robert Manfred, announced that the 2021 All-Star Game that was going to be in Atlanta will no longer be held in Atlanta. It's following this decision. Now, people might say, okay, whatever. 
just a game. No, it's not just a game. There's been reports, and this was according to CNN I had read, said that the loss of the All-Star game in Atlanta could cost uh, the city $100 million in revenue. That's a, that's nothing. To, that's nothing to sneeze at. All right? oh. That is nothing. Oh. To, nothing to sneeze at at all whatsoever. Right? Like more than I would thought. More than I would have thought. Hundred million. Jesus. And I thought one of the. So there's been a lot of talk about. And I'm gonna get your thoughts on this decision, Brian. But there's been a lot of reaction to it. Some people applauding MLB. I was surprised that MLB made this decision. I'll say that for the record. Why? Because MLB is generally not a progressive league. They've been slow to change. Uh, also, their league is overwhelmingly white, right? There's there's not a lot of black players there. There are a large percentage of Latino players that are over 35% now and growing. And they're also bringing fun to the game. That's for another podcast. Very <laughs> one of the top 100 players. Uh, right, are, are Latino. But I thought Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms tweeted out about the MLB's decision. She said, just as elections have consequences, so do the actions of those who are elected. Unfortunately, the removal of the, of the MLB All-Star game from Georgia is likely the first of many dominoes to fall until the necessary barriers put in place to restrict access to the ballot box are removed. Kudos to her for standing there. Do you think Keisha Lance Bottoms, uh, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, would have liked to have seen some more money coming to her city? Absolutely. Of course she would have. But you know what she's not going to stand for as a black woman leading that city? Racism. No, we're yep. not going to stand there and just be like, oh, this is okay. We're, nobody's going to stand and do this. Now, the, the response, which I want to hear from you, uh, Brian, the response from this by, you know, Governor Kemp and other people, and I will, I will talk to Governor Kemp's response. He said this, today Major League Baseball caved to fear, political opportunism, and liberal lies. Georgians and all Americans should fully understand what the MLB's knee-jerk decision means. Cancel culture and woke political activists are coming for every aspect of your life, sports included. If the left doesn't agree with you, facts and the truth do not matter. The attack on our state is a direct result of repeated lies from Joe Biden and Stacey Abrams about a bill that expands access to the ballot box and ensures the integrity of our elections. I would like him to expound on how it expands access to the ballot box, but we know that's not true. I will not back down. Georgians will not be bullied. We'll continue to stand up for secure, accessible, fair elections. Earlier today, I spoke with the leadership of the Atlanta Braves, who informed me they do not support the MLB's decision. I'm also going to add their response, which I would like you to respond to. The Braves said they're deeply disappointed by the decision. This was neither our decision nor our recommendation, and we are saddened that fans will not be able to see this event in our city. The Braves organization will continue to stress the importance of equal voting opportunities we had hoped our city could use to prevent this event as a platform to enhance the discussion. Our city has always been known as a uniter in divided times. That's not true. Martin Luther King would have something to say about that. Hank Aaron would have something to say about that. And we will miss the opportunity to address issues that are important to our community. Unfortunately, businesses, employees, and fans in Georgia are the victims of this decision. Now, nah, man, I think the victims are the people who are trying to be denied the right to vote. Those folks are the victims there, not those. What do you respond? What's your response, Brian, to all this? There's a lot there. You know, the, the, the people, they're attacking the left. They're saying that uh, the, the people are the ones who are hurt. The baseball fans are the ones who are hurt here. Keisha Lance Bottoms doesn't seem to be bothered by the fact of money not coming into her city. She's like, it is what it is. These are the dominoes that are going to fall. What do you think about what's going on here with the MLB and uh, the Braves response? I think it's very easy to be alarmist about this because I think, you know, people do that just sort of now reflexively. But I think that these are the kind of things that give us Stacey Abrams and people who lead these voting initiatives down in the South and really all throughout the country that are going to try to overcome this. Right. Like these are the kind of things that are just continue to wake that are going to continue to wake these people up. The thing that's funny is when old white Republican dudes just, you know, talk about cancel culture and they Mm -hmm. get mad. They get mad when like. This thing gets canceled and taken away from them. It's not canceled because the All-Star game is just going to move somewhere else. We don't know yet. Right. And who cares at this point? But, like, look, this these are the repercussions that you should face for putting a, a, a law that had people invoking Jim Crow this past week. You know what I mean? Like, th- this was the comparison. And historically, if you know anything about Jim Crow, like— Come on, like this is crazy right here. And I think I think with Georgia, 
it's it's also not surprising because like you saw you saw what happened at the election uh the presidential election and just you know the stop the count and all the shit from you know the echo chamber that was going on throughout the republican party and things of that nature like we know what it is and we know what these people are going to do and you know the brave statement i mean whatever i mean i <laughs> like i don't like I, i'm kind of just over statements at this point like I'm just over like company letterhead and then you know blah 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 quote dash CEO whatever like I would like it if it's I would like it to be stronger or just have a person's face saying it but we're simply not going to get that so yeah. from sports from sports organizations you know I'm not sure like what to really expect at this point um you know I'm just glad that MLB moved so swiftly especially after like to be honest I didn't expect them to to really do much of anything here Uh, in terms of removing the all-star game from the city of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because, as you said, like, this is kind of what baseball's done in terms of... Not what baseball's done. This is not really what baseball's done in terms of, like, what they believe in. Because we know it's a a league that largely skews uh, Republican, especially at the top. Not the players, necessarily, or not all the players, uh, but at the top of, you know, their leadership, that's sort of what it's been. And these things matter. You know what I mean? Like, these things matter that they're going to move it. Now, where they move it to was going to be interesting. Like, if we turn around and, you know, they move it to somewhere in Texas, then, (laughs) you know, we're doing all this celebrating for nothing. I have a feeling feeling they won't be doing that. But, yeah. Right. But that's the thing. Like, that can't be the case. And it also means, like, whether or not it's performative almost doesn't matter because it's something that, like, they've done. And it tells you that there are people there who at least want to appear to get this right. And I think that in itself kind of matters, like, too. You know, like, the NFL could do a much better job at that uh, in a myriad of ways. And we've talked about, like, is it possible that Roger Goodell wants to get the Kaepernick thing right because he doesn't want that on his resume? And I think there's something to that. We just don't know that that's the case because they haven't been able to get it right. And at least in this case, Major League Baseball has been able to do something. So now we'll see where they end up moving it to. Uh, from from what I saw, the All-Star game was supposed to be in Los Angeles next year. So, you know, I, I don't know if they're going to be able to move it to California, but they're going to have to figure out something. And where they move it to next matters. So I'm kind of waiting and see on this. But look, good for Major League Baseball for at least taking this step. We need a lot more steps, as we've been talking about for the past year. But this is something that helps. Yeah, I think it helps. I think the points you bring up, too, about whether it's performative or not are fair, right? I think we saw... Before this decision came down, this was my thought on this. This is an interesting moment. And the reason this is an interesting moment is because of the things we saw last summer. The outrage and we saw people taken to the streets to protest over the deaths of uh, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and countless others that have been murdered at the hands of the police in this country. T- countless other black and brown bodies, men and women throughout this country where this happened. And you and I want you brought up performative B, so I want to talk about this. We talked about this before, but I think it applies now. We saw a lot of companies. You talked about the letterheads and all this stuff, and put up BLM and your Blackout Tuesdays yep. and all this other stuff that people did. Right, press releases, press that were releases black. that were black. <laughs> we value black lives. We value our black workers. Video our, montages, video of montages, our black, of our black uh, employees, and things of that nature. Absolutely, and I'm here to tell you this. And I'm here to look in the camera as this podcast to tell you this. You can work for a place that can say Black Lives Matter and they damn sure don't value their black employees. I know. Trust me, I know. I know. Like, I know more than anyone. They'll talk all that stuff. They don't value their black employees. It's about the actions. I don't know why I'm laughing yet, but, yeah. it, you know. <laughs> they'll, they'll know. It's about the actions, right? It's about what you do. So when I was looking at this, I said, okay, well, Major League Baseball has an opportunity to step up here and take action and put their money where their mouth is. And to some degree, they actually have done that. They've put their money where their mouth is and said this. And now, but the real test is following this. I was reading something. I talked to you about this earlier. We had a phone conversation, and it was that they said that when Manfred was juggling this, some source said this, that he was thinking about, well, will players boycott the game? Would there be players who don't want to play in Georgia? And that was a factor in him maybe uh, pulling the MLB out. And then he started thinking that there's probably going to be residual effects there have been some sponsors that have spoken that say they don't support the bill. Two prominent Atlanta-based companies, Delta and Coca-Cola. Look, I'm going to say that the answer to how this goes is going to be very easy. You just got to put your Lester Freeman cap on. You got to follow the money. 
and you're going to see where it's going to go. And right now, if the money is saying they don't want to be associated with this, ain't nobody going to be associated with this. Because what these corporations, whether it's the MLB, whether it's Coke, whether it's Delta, whether it's other Atlanta-based uh, companies, they're not going to deal with it. Deal with it. You already have uh, some studios in Atlanta who, or some filming production companies who get tax breaks for filming in Georgia because it's cheaper to film there. Other states tell them to come film here, or they're saying they won't film in Georgia. When they, when the money starts screwing people over, they might be able to sneeze and say whatever to the All Star Game, but they can't sneeze, say sneeze to Delta who's a sponsor of the Braves as well, too. They can't sneeze to Coca-Cola and say, oh, whatever. That can't happen. So when it's going to be interesting to see baseball, like Keisha Lance Bottom said, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottom said, is the first domino. It's going to be intriguing to see how other dominoes fall. It's nice to see sports leading the way on this. It's not nice to see the lies that you hear from Governor Kemp talking about how people are trying to take away their sports. You ever notice how the uh, racist politicians always say that, the, that people are trying to take away stuff, take away yep. their freedoms, even though it's yep. funny the people that they're talking to never had any freedoms taken away. Shut up. You can't get talk about your freedoms taken away. You know nothing about that. It's that white fear that's trying to preserve what's left of the power that they think that they have, right? Like they want to keep things a certain way because they've always been a way that favored them and they feel everything slipping away from them because the country is getting more and more brown and more and more black. And, you know, th these are their retaliations for it. Um, I think you also brought up a good point about Delta and Coca-Cola. It's good that they were able to sort of like put themselves on the side here, right? And being like, look, you know, like these are the things that uh, that Georgia has to worry about too, uh, Major League Baseball in this case. And I think that with Delta and Coca-Cola and more sponsors – you know, stepping forward, then yeah, that'll change some things because these people are only worried about money at the end of the day, right? With those sponsors, they can't, last thing we'll say is they can't just step forward. I think there also has to be action on their side too. MLB has done it. Now, now I'm looking at these other sponsors like that are involved with the MLB or the Braves. What are you going to do? Um, yeah. and, and I'm sorry. One thing I will say, B, I don't want to see the Braves switch their tune on this and talk about they stand and they're against it and blah, 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 and they support... No, you guys had a chance to stand and support the MLB, and you didn't, and you're standing along with the idiot that leads that state that's going to be on the wrong side of history. And that's the thing. It's like, what do you want to be? We talked about living in the wrong places, right? Do you want to live Yo, in the right place yeah. or the wrong places, or do you want to be on the right or wrong side of history? Like, well, you, can, you can get this stuff right by just treating other people right. You can do the right thing. Yeah, and that's the shit that's annoying because it's like, that, it's not that hard. You know what I mean? For some people, apparently yeah, it apparently, is, but it's not, yeah, it's, it's not that people. hard. The solution for this is not that hard, right? Like, just just treat <laughs> people fairly. Like, it's right. not that complicated. So you know what I mean? Like, how, like it, it, look, the Atlanta Braves are a team, by the way, whom w at least one of the faces of their team is Ronald Acuna, who's an Afro-Latino. You know what I mean? And this is somebody who's like going to be the face of your team for the foreseeable future. I'll be a Freddie Freeman won the MVP last year. It was a shortened season, but we know Ronald Acuna is the most talented guy on that team. And it's like, like you can't align yourself with that dude, with Kemp. You know I what mean, I mean? I mean, all depends. Evidently you can't. All the, all the, all depend, I guess it all depends on who your owner is and how racist that person is or isn't. Like, it's so disrespectful. Like, I, I, I never understand. I mean, I never understand, but like billionaires always think about it with their money. But I never understand, especially the guys who have uh, these ownership stakes in these, you know, mostly minority franchises where it's like, yo, like, dog, look at your team, especially in basketball and football. But they don't care and they've never had to. And that's the part that's the part of it that sucks is because they've never had to care. They've never been held accountable. The world is changing, albeit slowly, but it is changing. We don't know how much change we're actually going to see in our lifetimes, but we know that we're going to look up someday and the billionaires of this country are hopefully going to be a lot different and a lot more, a lot different in terms of not just who they are, but how they look. All right, one time for your mind this week. Got some good stuff. Brian has something in. I, well, you got, I thought you had a bunch of stuff that you could have gone with this week. Um, I have some stuff to talk about in hip hop because we haven't talked about that in a little bit. I have a what I think is a front runner for album of the year. Uh, it's been early. I know we're only uh, four months, a little bit in, into the fourth month of the year, but I, it is early, and I do think. There was a standout hip-hop album of the year that I am thoroughly enjoying. 
But Brian, what you got for us this week on One Time for Your Mind? So Francisco Lindor was asked by Howie Rose, and if you're a Met fan, long-time play-by-play uh, radio announcer, radio voice of the New York Mets, um, about the name Frankie, right? And if he's sort of like, if he's cool with that, if he's comfortable with that, because it's a common nickname, you know, in terms of like, you know, just be someone named Francisco. And it's just a common thing in America, you know, to to, to simplify these sort of uh, Latin names, which is something I wrote about in a, in a piece this week. And, you know, Howie Rose asked him, and I really, really like Francisco Lindor's answer, so I wanted to talk about it. He's like, I like my name. Uh, Frankie, it's a little more Americanized for me. Frankie was fine. I never complained, but now I want my name. I want Francisco. Uh, my name is my name. Hashtag uh, Marlo Stanfield. Wow. And uh, he didn't look, say look, that look, at, look at us with the wide references in this episode. <laughs> he didn't say that point, but like, yo, and this is something I wrote about. Like, he's probably someone that's finding his voice. I think that what gets lost with these athletes, especially when we see guys like Jalen Brown come in right away, and they're very vocal about, you know, real progression in America with you know, equality and things of that nature, we sort of forget like some of the other guys who haven't quite been as vocal are also very young and probably haven't been radicalized to that degree. And in the case with Francisco Lindor, he's coming from another country. So I bring that up because he came up in the Cleveland Indians organization, uh, an organization that, you know, he was drafted by when he was 18 years old. And according to the podcast, I just heard with him and CC Sabathia, really love that organization, right? So he's there and people are just probably just calling him Frankie because this is what happens in America, right? Like your name sort of becomes this thing where like, let's try to make a nickname from it. I drew a lot of examples in the story I wrote where like, this is something that's very common. Like Jose, people will call you Joe or Joey in America, even though Jose is obviously a super Latin name. Evelyn automatically becomes Eve, you know, uh, mm. Isabella is something that becomes Bella or Izzy. Uh, mm. And shit, Ricardo, you got Rick, you got Rich, you got Richie, you got Richard, you got Ricky. Like, there's a whole bunch of things. And that's that's a totally different name in that case. You sound, you look like you wanted to jump in. Yeah, no, I just wanted to, I, I had a thought because I was wondering, um, I wonder for many of our Latino brothers and sisters, how often this is happening without them even being asked, right? And I thought, I thought about this that's because, the, that's the point. Because, yeah. because of, you know, I think it's wrong to for anybody of any background. Like, if you don't, you like, there had to be a time of you knowing me for some time before you could call me Dex. You just don't be calling people Dex when you don't know them. Like, that's my nickname. Almost everybody who knows me in a yeah. certain way calls me that. But I also didn't call Brian. Like I call Brian B. People hear that on this podcast. There's a time and level of familiarity before you call people that. And I generally like to ask people if yeah. they're comfortable with it uh, before I just do it. And I think what's disrespectful, what strikes me as disrespectful to our Latino brothers and sisters is that it seems like folks are just doing it without even asking if it's cool with it. And it does seem to happen a lot more to our Latino brothers and sisters. And yeah, my only thing to say is that's not cool. I just figured folks aren't even out here asking them. Yeah. And, the, and that's the thing, right? Like it, it's an automatic sort of thing when you're coming from Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, Venezuela, whatever, insert, you know, Latin country here. And they're coming over and it's it's super, uh, nicknames are just super American thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, they're not the only place that has nicknames, don't get me wrong, actually. Enrique Hernandez, Kike. Kike is a common nickname for Enrique, whatever. But at the same time, like, this is something that's not even asked. And the reason why it's a problem is because, as I mentioned with, like, Ricardo becoming Rich or Richie or Ricky or whatever, you're, it's a totally different name. Right. That goes from right. being somebody who's a Latino to being somebody who's just born in America. And that's what that's what Francisco Lindor's point in saying, like, you're Americanizing my name. Like, my name is clearly Francisco. If you call me Frank or Frankie, like, Frankie Lindor is not somebody who is from Caguas, Puerto Rico. You know what I mean? Like, it's, right. total, it's a totally right. different right. thing. Right. And, and, and it, it's it's like... It's, it's people are just so comfortable here with Americanizing that name and it's it, with Americanizing names, period, Latin names, especially, but it happens in other cultures. Like one of the people, when I wrote the story, a bunch of people, like 
I heard from a lot of people and I was retweeting a lot of people commenting about it because they had shared their stories. Mm -hmm. There was a woman who said, my name is Estefania and my teacher insisted on calling me Stephanie. Somebody else whose name was John Carlos and, you know, his teacher insisted that they call him John, just John. Uh, somebody else I know who's Italian, a friend of mine. And he said that what bummed him out a little bit was that, and this is a point I wanted to get to also, his grandfather, uh, who's Italian, his name mm -hmm. was Tommaso. And he legally changed it to Thomas to sort of assimilate himself to the American culture. Yeah. And this is something that like our generations are now tr uh, breaking away a little more from that was handed down back then. Like, don't rock the boat. And that's the thing that's common in, from like we, we get hurt, we get told that from like older black folks, older Latino folks. Mm -hmm. It's like, yo, don't rock the boat. You know, just stay in your lane. Just don't do this. Don't do that. You don't want to make them mad because of this, this, this and that. And the third. And we know what that is. And like. Now we're breaking away from that, which is the real encouraging thing about it, because we've been taught for so long, like, you don't want to sort of make the mad and we know who they are. And that's just the whole problem with America. We just talked about Georgia is like the whole the whole thing is like and this is how Joe Biden even became president. They're like, yo, he could he's somebody who can make the white people comfortable. And what we're trying to scream on the other side is who gives a fuck? Like, they're on the wrong side of history, so who cares about making them uncomfortable? So that's sort of what it is now. We're breaking away from that. But generations before us, they couldn't do that because they were so outnumbered. And now that things are progressing, maybe we're seeing some change in that regard as well. Well, that change starts with people like Francisco Lindor saying, my name is my name, right? Like, my name is my name. Do the right thing. You don't have to change my name. There is a culture. There's a heritage. There's a history behind my name. There's a pride behind uh, a person's name, no matter what your background is, and to try to strip that from people, yeah, it's not cool. And I, kudos to him, but also kudos. You and I spoke about this before. Kudos to how he rose for asking. Yep. Because that's the thing. Well, that was a point I was making. People are not asking, and they are just saying that we're giving you this nickname. And it's like, yo, man, I didn't even ask for that. So that's not that's not cool at all. And you know, we need to stop trying to let's call it what it is. Stop trying to whitewash the names yep. of our Latino brothers and sisters. If you can't say Estefania, the problem's with you. You're so lazy, you got to say Stephanie. Stephanie, because it's not even like you're saving syllables there. You're not. Right. You're actually right. saying the same amount of syllables there. Pretty you're much. And, and 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 the last point is like, no, this is not this is not saying like you can't nickname you know these people. It, it all comes down to like if the person is cool with the nickname, then fine, have a blast. But if they want you to call them by their given name, whether they're black, Italian, uh, Dominican, whatever the case may be, call them by their name. Like, that's really it. If yeah. they want to be called by their name, call them by their name. Don't just give them a nickname just because. You know what I mean? Like, if I know somebody named John Paul and I start calling him JP, but they prefer that I call him John Paul, then you got to call them John Paul. That's it. And yeah. the Howie Rose point is a good one, too, because that's one of the things I said in the thing. This is like the last thing I said was him asking the question is actually part of the solution, not the problem. So I'm glad that he at least is somebody who wants to get this right. Like we talked about with Major League Baseball, it sounds like they want to get the Georgia thing right. Like, more people wanting to get this right is important. Get these things right. Yeah, well, you can do the right thing. All right, my one time for your mind this week uh, surrounds the album I've been playing probably nonstop the last couple of weeks. It dropped March 19th. Uh, it is an album by Brooklyn native, represented Fort Greene, Coder the Friend. Uh, he did an album with our one of our favorite producers was up here on the podcast at, late last year, Static Selector. And this is a fantastically brilliant album called To Kill a Sunrise. I absolutely love it. The production is great. The first time I listened to it, uh, this was probably an album I listened through, through, and I think I smiled maybe the way Brian and I were smiling after listening to King's Disease. Um, not saying it is necessarily as good, but it had that same flow through it where I finished listening to it. I was like, man, this is a really good project. The production from Static Selected is just some of his best work. Really good. If you like boom bap like I do, you like jazz and piano loops and samples like I do, this is an album for you. Scratches in it, Coda's rapping good. It's probably some of the most focused work I've heard him on. He does a lot of rhyming over lo-fi beats generally, uh, sort of stream of conscious thought. But these were very well-structured songs, including songs where we got three verses, which is a rarity nowadays. Word. Uh, you, good point. <laughs> which is a rarity nowadays in hip-hop. But um, really good, really good messages of empowerment, messages of positivity, messages of, 
you know, going through stuff, staying positive, building with your community, that sort of the thing, not having letting anybody kill your spirit. And for me personally, uh, just listening through this and some things that have been going on in my life, this was a very uplifting and necessary album that just connects with me at the time. Um, really like what Coda had been doing for a while. I first heard him on a static track, I believe a little, about a year ago. I heard him on a static track that where Static had put out this album right when the quarantine started. I think it was called The Quarantine 1982. And he had a verse on there with a song with Terminology and CJ Fly. And I really liked this stuff. And then dug into him more. And uh, But this project, I heard this. To put, like I said, I was really excited. It, this project, B, I think is the best thing I've heard this year. It's, you know, I think it's a really, really damn good project. And, you know, I'm putting it in that kind of like 9 out of 10 range. It's that good. Um, I can listen to it all the way through. I think there are two songs in there that are weaker than the rest, but they're not like skips. Uh, if I was doing the cleaning house test, as you know I like, I'm not getting up uh, to hit my phone right. to, to, to skip it. Um, but I think this is a really good project. And it, what I think it makes me excited for two things. One, what else are other people going to come out? Three things, actually. One, what are other people going to come out with? Two, what's next from Coda? And three, what's next from Static? Because he's got projects he told us he's working on with Black Thought. Um, we know he's got stuff on Joey the Bad Joey Badass Joey is coming badass, out yeah. album. I still think Joey the Badass. I was also said Joey the Badass because I was saying Coda the Friend. Sorry, yeah. sorry, my Brooklyn brothers was not trying to mess y'all up like that. Joey Badass, <laughs> Coda the Friend. Um, CJ Fly I think has something dropping at some point this year, and Static produced his last project, project, Static May have Production there on there. A project so, that I liked also. Yeah, so I'm and Static has just been. You know, you can see how Static is getting some of these artists to get in with him focused. And Coda, I think this is the most focused he's been in terms of concepts on each song and subject matter and sticking through it and, and really getting through it and executing on each track. And it really, I, we spoke about Joey, I really, and we talked about that with Static when he's on here. I'd really like to see him do a project with just him and Joey. I think that would be great. That was one of the takeaways I took from this. It's like, man, he and Coda have really good chemistry, but I could really see him and Joey knocking this out the park. I really can see him knocking it out the park with a Black Thought uh, project. And I just think for myself, fans like myself who like Boom Bap, this is a very polished, modern, tribe, Midnight Marauder sound to this album that I really like. And it just speaks to me. So I love the sound of this album. So salute to Coda. Salute to Static. I'm loving the album. I don't see myself stopping playing it this year. It's just got a really good sound, really good replay. If you haven't checked it out, check it out. It's 10 tracks, 34 minutes, nice, easy listen, and just a great vibe. Can't, can't yeah, beat that. For sure. And for me, it's the album of the year so far also. I mean, granted, we haven't really <laughs> we haven't really gotten a lot of albums worth listening to at this point this year. But um, it's an album that I played a few times straight through. I definitely have a few joints that I really, really like. Uh, we talked about Sunrise a little bit. Uh, on the phone at some point uh the opening track wolves sort of kept me in right away that was one of my favorites i don't know which is my favorite at the moment but i think wolves is probably the, the song that i've played the most so far either that or the love Maybe i think the love. the love is my favorite i think it's a the favorite loop. it's a great song that's a great song. yeah great piano and, loop great yeah. scratches and static went went crazy on this it re- it's an album that sort of reminds me of how I experienced uh, Coffee and Kush last year with Problem. Mm. Um, because it came out, the first one came out around the same time, and then he doubled back with a second one in the summer. But the first one came ar- around the same time. It was like mid to late March. And it was a pro- it was a project that I had no like expectations for because I didn't know it was coming out. Yeah. I just sort of saw it one day. A song just sort of brought me there. I started listening to it and I was like, yo, this is really good. It was like 11 joints and I probably only have one or two skips, maybe like two, um, like similar to this album. And it was like a lot of jewels, a lot of things that were pretty timely as well. Um, and I feel the similar, a, a similar way about, uh, this album. So unless we get like some crazy albums to end the year, we'll be talking about Coda again in our top 10 later this year. I'm confident. I'm confident of that really good album. Salute to Coda, salute to static, uh, Coda. We like your work, man. Hopefully we can get you up here on the podcast. You know, talk talk to you about it, Brooklyn brother. Like what he's doing. He's grinding independent too, independent artists. So like supporting yeah. him and making sure he, he's getting that work uh out there and the listens out there. But if you haven't listened to that, definitely check it out. 
hopefully, I remember like this time last year, Brian and I were kind of like, where are the really good hip hop albums? And then, uh, you know, the summer came and we got King's Disease and we were both smiling and very happy. So, <laughs> you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully we get some more. I think there's some more heat coming and we're still waiting on that Bruno Mars, Anderson Pack album. Oh. That should be really good that I'm still waiting for. Uh, but yeah, it should be a good year for music as we move on. All right, that's hopefully, it for this episode. Hopefully, hopefully we get uh, Kendrick this year too. And uh, I feel like Jay the Cole. fall off has got to come out at some point. Yeah, I think so. Maybe in the fall. We'll get, we'll get that. Yeah. Uh, all right, that's it for this episode of the Ain't Hard Tell Podcast, episode 173. Please continue to support us uh, as independent podcasters. Uh, we like all the support you've given us and what we continue to do. More stuff coming. We were guest heavy last month. Hopefully, you get a little bit more of Brian and I talking this month. We're starting to get underway with baseball season. You see, I'm rocking the Mets shirt on this episode. Baseball season uh, is going. We're getting closer to the NBA playoffs. We're about five weeks away from that. So, a lot going on in the world of sports. There'll be a lot for us to talk about, and healthy things in hip-hop start heating up as well, too. Uh, so as I said, please continue to support us, subscribe, do all of that. Leave us a good rating and review if you like what we had to talk about. So for episode 173 of the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast, he's Brian Fonseca. I'm not going to mess up his name or give him a ridiculous nickname and take away from it like nobody should. I'm Dexter Henry. Until next time, y'all. Peace. Shout out DMX. DMX, stay strong. Stay strong, DMX. Stay strong. Keep your head up. Yeah.